What I did was put together some questions for both governors, Governor Dunleavy and Governor Edwards from Louisiana, because I think there's some real similarities in uh, different issues around the energy transition. And so um, both Governor Dunleavy and I have already spoken, so Governor Edwards, we're going to go to you first. But let's say it this way. Um, you're both governors of traditional energy states in natural gas and oil. Um, how do you view this energy transition? How do you view your state's role where tra traditional fuels are concerned, as well as the impacts to communities that are reliant upon resources that may be declining? So in other words, and I think this takes on maybe a bit of a different perspective because of liquefied natural gas and the exporting of LNG and the geopolitics around that. But Governor Edwards, if you could just spend a moment talking about how you see the role of oil and gas in the energy transition in Louisiana. And then I'm going to ask the same question of Governor Dunleavy. Thank you, Governor Ritter and Governor Dunleavy. It's great to be with you, uh, even if it's only virtually. I do look forward to getting back uh, to Alaska. Um, look, there's no doubt that the world is moving away from fossil fuels um, and that it has to if it wants to avoid even more severe impacts to our climate. But this is going to be a transition. It is going to be gradual. It's going to be over a, a considerable period of time. Um, but the transition won't be complete, meaning we're still going to be producing and, and burning natural gas and oil even after the transition is done. Uh, and it's certainly not going to happen overnight. And the shock to international and domestic energy markets of the past few months, um, and certainly the invasion of Ukraine has had an impact on that uh, because it, it did further disrupt uh, the supply and demand uh, issues that had been uh, building for some time. But I think it shows just how dependent the global economy remains on traditional fuels. Uh, we've tried to approach this in a balanced way. And this is where I kind of get back on the song sheet uh, that we just heard uh, from former Energy Secretary Rick Perry. Uh, we, we recognize that we need to reduce emissions um, but that rejects uh, short-handed, I'm sorry, short-sighted actions like halting lease sales in the Gulf overnight. I think that that undermines our long-term strategy. Um, and our initial steps involve finding ways to better manage carbon emissions from fuels, uh, traditional fuels and processing of feedstock by supporting investment in new technologies such as carbon capture and sequestration. At the same time, we want to make sure that we're developing other energy sources, such as hydrogen, solar, wind, biofuels, that we expect to play a tremendous role uh, moving forward. And in that way, our traditional fuels and the communities that depend upon uh, that industry can still be supported in the near term and have time to adapt to new opportunities with the development of new energy sources and all of the investment and the jobs that are going to come with that transition. You know, yesterday's oil and gas companies are actively remaking themselves into tomorrow's multifaceted energy companies. The markets and their shareholders are demanding it. Louisiana has demonstrated our readiness to remake our energy sector alongside them. And we believe we have superior infrastructure and logistics capabilities. <laughs> Obviously, we have abundant natural resources here, a skilled workforce, access to global and domestic markets. And all of that combined with an unambiguous commitment to decarbonization, we believe we've made Louisiana a very attractive location for companies looking to invest in the energy uh, future. And if we stay the course, our economy uh, can be a victor rather than a victim of the energy transition. And we can ensure Louisiana will be an energy leader for decades to come, just as we've been over the last hundred years. So Governor Edwards, I've always said it's important to be, you, you said a victor versus victim, which is a good construct. I've also said be the architect rather than the victim of. So, uh, Governor Dunleavy, kind of the same question for you uh, as Governor Edwards about this time we're in where an oil and gas economy is still part of your economy. We're in transition. How do you view that role and then what are the kinds of things that you see in the future for the oil and gas economy? Okay, can you hear me? Give me a second here. Can you hear me? Oh, there we go. So, uh, great question. And I think the key there, the key term is transition. Um, for example, I think what you're seeing in uh, Germany, for example, and parts of Europe, 
even prior to the war, was an abrupt ending of. Uh, there were decommissioning of nukes, for example, in France. In Germany, they were getting off of uh, nukes as well as coal. So I think the key to the future, where everyone can get around, is the concept of transition. What does that transition look like? How long does it take? How long do you replace a certain fuel with another energy source that, because of technology, becomes economically feasible for a, p a particular locale? That's what makes Alaska very interesting. Um, you know, uh, John Bell State, obviously, you guys know, is a huge gas state, uh, a, a, a oil state as well. But they also have tremendous opportunities, as he's mentioned, on, on wind and solar, et cetera. I mentioned I came from Scranton, Pennsylvania, which was the anthracite coal capital of the world. Just a couple miles north of Scranton is the epicenter for the Marcellus shale gas industry, which by some estimates dwarfs most, uh, most gas reserves in the United States. And underneath that particular reserve is the Utica uh, gas reserve that's barely being scratched. And so gas is a base load, as was mentioned earlier, I think is going to be key. And if we accept that, meaning all of us accept that for a, at least a, a certain period of time, that gas needs to be there when you switch on that light, if for, uh, if for reasons that this, this solar or wind, uh, other types of uh, renewables don't supply that energy at that time with, uh, to, that, to that magnitude, that we still have gas as an underwriter. The other thing that's really not mentioned at this point, we're talking about energy, but um, the idea of gas and its, its role in fertilizers. Uh, let alone gas and oil and, and the role in other types of strategic uh, um, uh, products such as pharmaceuticals, clothing, et cetera, plastics. But when you go back to gas, in Alaska, we had a, uh, we had a, a, a urea plant that was operating in the Kiski that would export fertilizer all over the place. That plant closed down because of a lack of gas. What does that mean for us? It means we're going to have higher food prices. And what's, re what's going on in uh, the Ukraine and Russia right now means we're going to have very, very high food prices. And those food prices will be even higher because of the cost of fuel right now. So the idea of transition has to be worked out carefully and agreed upon. And I don't want anyone to think that the concept, what I'm trying to do is, it's a veiled attempt at saying there's going to be no transition. No, not at all. The, the technologies and the benefits of a transition, I think, are, are overwhelming. It's how we do it, how we go about doing it, to make sure that there's no abrupt ending and then there's a gap which then will cause people, in my opinion, to lose faith in a renewable future, a sustainable future. The other thing, John Bell, I would mention is that I think it's incredibly important, and I mentioned this uh, to um, the Undersecretary of Energy that is here today, uh, and will be part of this conference, uh, as well as to Secretary Granholm, and, and that is um, we have to get the agencies in Washington and just like we, we do with our agencies here in the state, we have to get the agencies in Washington to move quickly uh, and expeditiously to permit new projects involving not, not just gas, but renewables, transmission, uh, um, uh, making sure that uh, you know, whatever licenses and permits need to happen for any type of renewable concept or even nukes, that it happens in a very uh, a, a quick manner, not, not disregarding safety, but when you're looking at building a, uh, uh, or co committing or completing a project that's going to take 7, 9, 12, 15 years, your technology is advancing so rapidly that um, you're not going to be able to take advantage of some, some of these technologies in, in, a, in, a, uh, in a manner that's conducive to helping people quickly in the near future. So I would say, uh, Governor, that um, gas is going to be with us, uh, and, and I would hope that people could get around the idea that gas will be with this as a base load underwriter for some time, let alone for the purpose of, of fertilizer uh, and other products. Will technologies at some time eclipse the need for gas? I, I have a lot of faith in mankind. I believe it will. But is it tomorrow? No. And that's what we just have to, um, I, I guess, agree upon once again is transition. What does it look like? How do you define it? And can we get around it?